Protected natural environments, including national parks, marine parks and world heritage areas, are incredibly attractive settings for tourism. Tourism can contribute to their protection by increasing awareness and support from visitors. Tourism can also be an economic argument for conservation. Research at the University of Queensland has identified that tourists make a significant economic contribution to regions around national parks, providing jobs and a contribution to the state's gross domestic product. But there is a catch. Too much tourism or inappropriate tourism can have negative impacts that not only damage the environment we want to protect, but can also ruin the tourism experience. The challenge is to plan and manage tourism appropriately to minimise negative impacts so that tourism is sustainable in the long term in these special places. Fortunately, the managers of protected areas, along with the tourism industry, are finding solutions to this challenge. Here are three key principles for planning and managing tourism in protected areas. The first principle is environment-centred planning. That is, to plan and manage the underlying resource for ongoing environmental sustainability, identifying where and what type of tourism is appropriate. Tourism should only be introduced if this first principle can be met. Second, involve the tourism industry in developing guidelines and management systems for infrastructure and operations that are innovative and sensitive to the setting. Third, continually monitor for impacts and be flexible and adaptable to minimise any negative tourism impacts. A good example of the first principle of putting the environment first in planning is the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. The Great Barrier Reef is the world's largest coral reef system, stretching for 2,300 kilometres along the Queensland coast. It is a World Heritage Area and multiple use marine park, including conservation, commercial and recreational fishing, tourism and shipping. Tourism is the most significant economic activity in the marine park. In 2004, a major planning exercise based on ecologically representative areas was completed. 70 different habitats or bioregions in the Great Barrier Reef were identified and mapped. Over 21,000 stakeholders were consulted in the planning. The entire Great Barrier Reef was zoned for different uses. This map shows a section of the Great Barrier Reef. Human access is restricted in the preservation zone, shown in pink, and the orange scientific research zone. The Marine National Park Green Zone is equivalent to a terrestrial national park and allows tourism which is look but don't take while the yellow conservation zone allows some limited recreational fishing. The blue zones allow more activities, including managed commercial fishing. Within the zoning process, locations that would be suitable and available for different types of tourism were identified, mainly in the green and yellow zones. Tourist operator Peter Gash explains how the Great Barrier Reef zoning process and declaration of green no-take zones have enhanced fish populations around his ecotourism resort on Lady Elliot Island. The Marine Park Authority, the Great Reef Marine Park Authority, have put it together a system of zones and zoning to protect it in different ways, to permit certain things, such as fishing and snorkeling and diving and tourism. And Lady Elliot is, is very fortunate in that um, one of the things that we worked with the Marine Park Authority back in 2004-2005, we got declared a green zone, which is total protection. No fishing, no spearing, no taking. And um, it was always a beautiful place in the water. When we first came here, it wasn't a green zone. It wasn't protected. We could take people fishing and it happened that people would come out here, they'd go fishing, they'd come back, people would come in here, they'd go spearing. So when I first snorkeled here, there was no big fish. They'd been hooked or speared or whatever or maybe they ran away because they knew it was a dangerous place, whatever. They weren't here. You'd found very few big fish in the 80s and even the early 90s. In 2004, it got declared a green zone. Well, we're now 12 years into it. It's unbelievable out there. The big fish are everywhere. And it just, it just proves without a doubt that declaring it a green zone and protecting it makes a lot of sense. Our second principle 
is to ensure that any infrastructure and operations are environmentally sustainable and innovative. Scientific information is important as a basis for sound operating guidelines. But in addition, experience has shown that ecotourism operators are the people who are out there in the sensitive environment every day observing what is happening. Operators have the incentive to protect the resource they use and have been the real innovators of ways to protect the environment. For example, in the Great Barrier Reef, operators have developed systems of floats for snorkelers to hold on to so they don't stand on the coral. Some tourism operators who are passionate about the environment in which they operate are always looking for new ways to operate sustainably. Many operators become accredited through associations such as Ecotourism Australia and follow guidelines to operate in a sustainable manner. Shane O'Reilly operates a resort next to a national park in the World Heritage listed rainforests of southeast Queensland. Here he talks about management actions they take and about requirements for holding advanced ecotourism certification. Well, I suppose again that's in two sets. It's uh, the back of house stuff from the way we handle sewerage, for example. We, a few years ago, we spent a uh, million dollars on an A-plus sewerage plant and, uh, and that water that comes out of that sewerage plant, now you can actually drink if you really want to give it a go. Um, but uh, I think those type of things are important and recycling and that type of thing. But probably more importantly is the other side was where you're educating people, your guests, as well as day trippers, on to how they learn about uh, a little brown bird, which they'd walk past not look at, but they might uh, get told a story about that log runner and how it fits into the, the bigger scheme of things and how its existence actually is important to the wider scheme of a national park. Well, I think uh, with ecotourism certification, there's, uh, uh, I remember when we did our first one, we didn't really have to change or do anything much because we were generally doing all the things that tick the boxes. What do you find you've got to do is you've got to measure it. And that's probably something that we were never very good at because we just did it and we, we didn't ever bother measuring. But measuring uh, things like landfill, for instance, and, and tracking that in energy use per, um, uh, per guest night, it, it's, uh, it's helpful, I suppose, to make sure you're not uh, slipping on the wrong side of the ledger. Uh, but that's uh, something I think that the, that's what O'Reilly's had to, basically had to do what was new. And when it came to you know, using water and having dual flush bathrooms now that we're and retarders and all the taps. Well, we already had all that stuff. We didn't have to change anything uh, when we went on to got advanced ecotourism. The third principle is to monitor and adapt. We have heard how individual accredited ecotourism operators monitor indicators such as waste and energy use and report on their operations regularly. For a protected area as a whole, it is important to monitor and identify any negative impacts that may be occurring due to tourism operations or other reasons including external impacts such as climate change. If problems are identified, it is essential to adapt use to try to minimise or prevent environmental damage. The format of adaptive management has been adopted for the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park using the Management Effectiveness Cycle. Every five years, the Great Barrier Reef Outlook Report is produced based on extensive research and monitoring to examine the reef's health, pressures and likely future. Notably, the reef tourism industry has not shown any significant negative environmental impacts to date. Planning for the future is then based on the results of monitoring and research. The current Reef 2050 Long-Term Sustainability Plan includes using the International Union for the Conservation of Nature's Management Effectiveness Cycle with the steps of context, understand the system through research and monitoring via the Outlook Report, planning, plan for the long term, inputs, fund the plan's actions, process, involve stakeholders in management, outputs, implement the actions of the plan, outcomes, evaluate outcomes, 
and go back into review and planning again. Dr Fergus Malloy of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority explains the approach being taken for the Great Barrier Reef to ensure adaptive management for the long term. Look, uh, as, as I, said, I said, it's a learning from doing process. Um, uh, we, we are all about adaptive management, but I think, I think the Reef 2050 plan is, is, is a big step forward for, for us. It's a big leap forward to bring all of our current management as well as new management actions under the one plan. And this includes not only you know, what Gabrumpa is doing, but what the state government is doing, what industry is doing, communities are doing. They're, they're all part and parcel of, of, of this plan, all brought together. It's a major step forward. The uh, Reef 2050 plan itself is certainly not perfect, but again, that's part of adaptive management as well. I mean, we, we will improve it as we move forward. Uh, there is a midterm review of it in 2018 to deal more with um, uh, the objectives and targets and making them more, more specific. We've learned that conditions needed for long-term success of tourism in protected areas include having a good understanding of the natural environment and ecosystems, funding for good planning and monitoring, time and effort dedicated by tourism operators, the ability and will of governments and industry to counter or adapt to any environmental threats, and acceptance by tourists that the privilege of enjoying these environments brings the responsibility to act appropriately and perhaps contribute to the cost of good planning and management. So, we can see that tourism and protection of significant natural environments can coexist, provided there is effective planning and management. This brings economic benefits, enjoyment by visitors and understanding and support for conservation.